With poems on various subjects, religious and moral, published in 1773, Phyllis Wheatley became the first English-speaking person of African descent to publish a book, and only the second woman of any race or background to do so in America. Written in Boston while she was just a teenager, and when she was still a slave, Wheatley's work was an international sensation. In Phyllis Wheatley, Vincent Carrada offers the first full-length biography of this remarkable woman. The Massachusetts Historical Society has a substantial collection of Phyllis Wheatley's material. In her collection, we have letters, drafts of poems and elegies, printed editions, and even her writing desk. Professor Coretta worked with uh, the Society's collections as a law, NIH long-term fellow, in, uh, research fellow in 2008 and 2009. So it's fitting that he returns here tonight. And we're so pleased that this book is being launched here tonight with all of you. So it's the first time we are seeing it and hearing about it. So it's, it's wonderful to have him uh, honor us with this distinction. Vincent Coretta is a professor of English at the University of Maryland. His most recent books are Equiano, the African, bi uh, the African Biography of a Self-Made Man, and Life and Letters of Philip Quique, I hope I pronounced that correctly, the first African-Anglican missionary, which he co-edited with Ty M. Rees. So I hope all of you will welcome Professor Coretta and Phyllis Wheatley, Biography of a Genius in Bondage. Phyllis Wheatley is now recognized as a pioneer in African-American literature. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. has called her the mother of African-American literature. There are high schools, junior high schools, elementary schools named after her. If you Google the name Phyllis Wheatley, you'll get almost 30,000 hits as of yesterday. <laughs> when I wrote the book, I mentioned that uh, you get 15,500 hits, so it's increasing geometrically. In 2005, a 174-word letter of hers sold at auction for $253,000, more than double what they expected to get for it, and that's about a little over $1,400 a word, which by anyone's definition means that she has cultural capital. She hasn't always had that amount of cultural capital. Her reputation has had its ups and downs. In her own lifetime, there was about a five-year period where she was an international celebrity. Uh, one of her black contemporaries, Ignatius Sancho, whom she never met, called her a genius in bondage, and hence the subtitle for my biography. But in the last few years of her life, she was, went into relative obscurity. In the 1960s and 70s, she was frequently denounced by particularly black critics who considered one critic accused her of having a white mind. Uh, the people were upset because they felt she did not object to slavery enough that she did not take a position that they imagined they would have taken if they had lived in her time. But she's undergone a renaissance in the last, certainly, 20 years, where people, during which people have actually started to look at her work and have noticed how subversively she can sometimes be dealing with slavery, especially when she was still a slave. When you try to write a biography, I, this is my second biography, so I guess I can say I'm a biographer. <clears throat> I mean, I've never really thought of myself that way. But whenever you write a biography, especially if you don't have an autobiography by the subject, and even if you have an autobiography, they rarely say, and I now die. Boom. <laughs> <clears throat> so there's always something you have to fill in. But it's always a puzzle that you're trying to recreate, and you're always missing some parts. Sometimes they're very substantial parts. There's also a problem trying to deal with deciding how to deal with the context. 
the, the tactical problems. In someone like Wheatley's case, what do, you, what do you say, how much do you say about colonial America? How much do you say about slavery in New England? How much do you say about the American Revolution? How much do you say about events in England that had effects on America? And how do you do that without burying your subject in the context? There's also the problem of how do you deal with what I call the afterlife, uh, the reception history of your subject, especially if your subject is an author. And how do you deal with modern literary critics? Uh, there's no better way to bury a biography than to have an indigestible lump of literary criticism. And yet, you do need to engage with it because you're writing about someone who in part is a subject because she produced literature. Now, Phyllis Wheatley is an interesting uh, case because she also she has inherent interest. Her own her life has inherent interest, but one has to resist the temptation with someone like Phyllis Wheatley to write literary biography, to write biographical criticism, in which you try to extract biography from her literature, and which would be a very naive way of looking at her literary output, as if it's all transparent and autobiographical. What I've tried to do is write a critical biography instead, one in which I try to locate her literary output in her life, rather than trying to draw her life out of her poems. Now, <clears throat> writing Phyllis Wheatley's biography in particular is challenging because whenever you try to write or reconstruct the life of an early modern woman, uh, by that I mean a woman uh, living before, especially before 1800, you have a challenge as soon as she becomes married because then she legally becomes subsumed under her husband's identity. You have that problem is doubled when she's a woman of African descent and a former slave. Because unfortunately, when people are slaves, they're property, defined as property, and more records were kept of them as property. <clears throat> For example, wills can often allow us to track someone of African descent if they're a slave, if they're inherited by someone else. But once someone becomes free, there's less interest by others in recording their existence. This is especially difficult in New England, because in New England, blacks often were not identified as blacks unless it was relevant to the situation, if they're, especially if they're free blacks. So sometimes you have to follow a trail until you can see a thread line and you can find one time where you know this person's identified as being of African descent and then you can backtrack and see that this works its way through. With Phyllis Wheatley, we have three, we had three basic texts that we relied on for information about her life. The first one that everyone goes back to was Margaret, Margareta Matilda O'Dell's memoir and poems of Phyllis Wheatley, A Native African and, and a Slave, published in Boston in 1834. And this text has to be dealt with with great care. Another text is Nathaniel Shur Shurtleff's Proceedings. Uh, he published a very brief account, about eight pages long, but much more reliable, which he published in the Mass uh, Proceedings of the Massachusetts Historical Society. And then 
William Robinson's Phyllis Wheatley and Her Writings, published in New York in 1984. This year is the 250th anniversary of Phyllis's arrival in Boston as, a sla as an enslaved African girl. And yet, mine is the first full-length biography of her, or attempted a full-length biography. And I should admit that Conrad Wright, when I first met him, his first question, I believe, was, you really think you can produce a biography of Phyllis Wheatley? And my response was, well, why did you fund me? <laughs> <laughs> now, the methodology, I have a methodological guide that I follow, uh, one that might not be familiar to you as a methodological guide. His name is Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and it's trust but verify. In other words, look at all the sources, but double check them whenever you can or as historians would say, falsify the evidence, if you can. A brief summary of her life. She arrived in Boston in July of 1761. We know she was about seven years old because her two front teeth were missing. She was bought by Susanna and John Wheatley, who had... 18-year-old twins, Nathaniel and Mary Wheatley, at the time. Her first published poem appeared in a Rhode Island new newspaper in 1767. She gained international or transatlantic fame in 1770 when she published an elegy on the death of George Whitfield, who died in Massachusetts during his seventh tour, preaching tour of America. Uh, George Whitfield was the great Methodist evangelist. By 1772, she had, published, she had published and written enough poems that she and her owners attempted to publish a volume of her poetry. And they uh, issued a subscription proposal trying to get enough uh, subscribers to convince the publisher that it was worth taking the risk to publish her. They didn't get enough subscribers at the time, people were saying, because people had doubts as to whether she could have actually written the poems herself. Susanna Wheatley turned to the Countess of Huntington in England as, as a potential patron. The Countess sent over some of her missionaries who interviewed Phyllis got her to produce poems in their presence, and she decided that she would support publication of the book. Phyllis went to England in 1773, was there for only six weeks, didn't stay long enough to see the book actually get published, but upon her return, she wrote a letter to David Wooster, another American, and she said, told him that she had been given freedom upon, after she had returned at the desire of her friends in England. The publication of the book, as Dennis mentioned, brought her great fame. And after she got free, her poems became increasingly a critical of slavery. She published a letter to the Presbyterian Indian minister, Samuel Ockham, in a, in well, it was widely distributed in newspapers throughout the colonies, in which she directly attacks slavery, refers to slave owners as the modern Egyptians. And as I said before, Ignatius Sanchos praised her in 1778, Jupiter Hammond, another black poet in New York, wrote a poem addressed to her, though, again, they never met. In 1774, soon after she had returned, uh, Susanna Wheatley died. Apparently, Phyllis continued to live with John Wheatley. He died in March of 1778, and according to all accounts, 
until today. She married John Peters on April 1st, 1778, just a few weeks later. In 1779, she issued proposals for a second volume of poetry and letters, which was never produced and never published. And then in five Dece- on 5 December 1784, she died. And according to uh, Odell, she died in desperate poverty with the last of her three children dying with her. And she had been abandoned by her scoundrel husband, John Peters, who absconded and just left her. And Odell says Peters went south. Very discouraging news for a biographer. (laughs) There's a lot south of Boston. (laughs) And so let me let me talk now about briefly about some of the discoveries I've made uh, in the early, middle, and late part of her life. And I'll talk a bit about John Peters because those of you who are Wheatley Files probably pretty curious as to whether I found anything about him. Let me start with the the early part. She has been often referred to as a native of Senegal. In fact, in 1971, Senegal issued a stamp commemorating her. So she's something of a national hero. The basis for this uh, assumption it's a series of extraordinary letters, extraordinary in the fact that they exist at the Medford Historical Society, letters from Timothy Fitch to Peter Gwynn. Peter Gwynn was the captain of Fitch's slave ship. And this is, it's extraordinary because these are, as far as I know, the only correspondence that refers to uh, the ship that actually brought a specific person of African descent that we can identify. Because Gwyn was commanding Fitch's ship, whose name was Phyllis, and he tells him repeatedly, go first to Senegal, stay very briefly there, do not buy girls, do not buy women, buy young men, If you can't get them fast, keep going down the coast. Gwynn spent four months off the coast of Africa during a period when slave captains did not want to linger along the coast of Africa because of disease, a very high mortality rate, especially among the European crew off the coast of Africa. But in 1716, 1761, Britain was at war with France, and the coast of Africa was one of the theaters of war. So he's telling him, don't spend a lot of time there. Keep moving. The odds are extremely low that Gwynne would have used any part of his cargo space to buy a seven-year-old girl as his first choice. The odds are extremely great that a seven-year-old girl would have been the last, about the last thing he would have purchased because she'd have no resale value in America. She would be what's, what was called a refuse slave. And if you look at the ads in the newspaper that refer to the ship when the ship arrived in Boston that we know carried Phyllis, it says that she came from the Windward Coast, which is much further down. That gets down as far as uh, modern-day Guinea off the African coast. So that's one of the things that, uh, in her early life, will change, I think, uh, the way we perceive Phyllis Wheatley. Her education, of course, was extraordinary. Everyone recognizes that. What I've done in the biography is to try to norm her education, to compare it to both a white contemporary girl, Anna Green Winslow, 
who kept a journal and who records what she was reading. And she was reading children's versions of books such as Gulliver's Travels and uh, Samuel Richardson's Clarissa. So sort of what we might call dumbed down versions. Whereas Phyllis, we know, was reading in translation Homer, Pope, not Pope, not in translation. She was reading adult literature from a very early age. I have also compare her education to that of Chloe Spear, a, a young slave, roughly Phyllis's equivalent, who had to fight to get some education and never achieved the literacy level that Phyllis did. I also discovered Jeremy Belknap's diary. Looking through his diary, I discovered on the last page, he's, he writes Phyllis's earliest effort, Phyllis's first effort, and it's a little poem. It's not a very good poem, and he says that it was written when she was 11. Now, the earliest poem we knew about was written when she was about 14, may not seem like much, but three years is a very significant uh, difference when you're comparing to 11. And if you compare the first, what we now know as the first poetic piece that she wrote with the next one, it's extraordinary the, the development that you can see. I mean, it, you would not be, it's hard to believe that the same person could write both, but clearly she did. Let me jump to the middle of her career to give you an example of something that I discovered or that, let's say, I'm arguing. I mentioned that she goes to, she went to London in 1773. 1773, she, she arrived almost a year to the day of the Mansfield decision in which the Lord Chief Justice declared that no colonial slave brought to England could be legally forced back to the colonies. And Phyllis, remember she tells her correspondent that she was freed at the desire of her friends in England. Now one of the people she mentions meeting in England was Benjamin Franklin, and Americanists get very excited about that, and they think, whoa, you know, maybe he was, you know, had some influence. Well, at, the, at that time, Benjamin Franklin had a slave with him in, in England. But people have tended not to notice that the person she speaks most about was Granville Sharp, who she tells us was our tour guide. He took her to the British Museum and to the Tower of London, where they saw the caged lions. It's impossible for me to believe that Granville Sharp, having the greatest the most, the best known enslaved celebrity in the British Empire with him does not bring up the Mansfield decision. Assuming she didn't know about beforehand, it was covered in all the Boston papers before she left, including papers she was publishing in. And I think that what she did was she said to her uh, master, Nathaniel Wheatley, who had brought her to England, to try to find a publisher, that I'll go back with you, but only if you swear in front of these witnesses in England. He was a merchant, so his, his word was his bond, that I will be free if I do so, at the desire of my friends in England. And so she does go back, and, and she is freed uh, essentially immediately. And I think that one of the lessons we should learn from this is that we need to respect her as much for her ability to ma manipulate other people as for her ability to manipulate words. Her marriage. <clears throat> as I said, we all say she married on April 1st. I've always felt a little uncomfortable about that because we have two surviving letters from her one in May and one in July of 1778, in which she signs off as Phyllis Wheatley, not as Phyllis Peters. 
And in fact, she, one of them, she says, please direct any letters to me to John Peters' home in Queen Street. Well, doing some digging away again here at Massachusetts Historical Society into the records of John Lathrop, the minister, and the churches in, Bo in the Boston area, I discovered that she, was, she and John Peters married on Thanksgiving Day, 1778, and November 26th. So they were, as we would say, living in sin, um, which is not the way we usually think of Phyllis, prim, proper, and pious. There's also the question of children. We're told that she had three children. Unfortunately, I found no record of any children, no birth records or baptismal records. It doesn't guarantee that there were none, but I, I was not able to find any. And I'll now I'll jump to a, a late example, and this will get us to John Peters. Who was he? How do you track down the John Peters? Well, fortunately, there were not many John Peters, very fortunately. The first time I find the John Peters was on a list of many people as plaintiffs suing Joseph Scott, a loyalist who fled Boston in the early 1770s. And they were trying to recover debts from him. And in the 18th century, the way you recover debts is by suing, basically. <clears throat> you didn't have a lot of choice. And John Peters has been accused of having been uh, a, a litigious, having presented himself, foisted himself off as a lawyer, as a doctor, etc. And particularly by Odell, and then people have, have picked up on that and repeated it. Well, on this list, John Peters is not identified by race. The reason I think he's a John, I thought he was a John Peters is he's the only person on that list who is not referred to as Mr. So that was the beginning of the thread. Now, this, his suit against Joseph Scott keeps going, he keeps repeating it for the next, oh, seven years. And of course, he always wins, but he can never recover the money because Scott has fled. But it's a sign of his desperation in trying to get his money. There's, in 1780, he and Phyllis are doing quite well. He, uh, and again, we know these, this from lawsuits. He's suing someone, a business partner. They've been conducting business in western Massachusetts. And in 1780, I, I spent a lot of time with Kim looking at, at uh, what are called taking books, tax records, prison books, court books at the Massachusetts archives. And one of the big gaps in Phyllis Wheatley's life is from 1780 to the end of 1783. Suddenly she goes completely off the, the radar screen. In 1779, John Peters is suing a business partner, and he eventually wins a suit. And what's nice about that is he wins costs. And his costs include travel costs. And when one looks at the quarterly records, because the court met quarterly, one looks at the, the first couple of quarters, there's no travel costs. The last couple of quarters, there's 30-mile travel costs. Now, Odell says that at one point, she certainly gets wrong when this might have happened, but she says that they moved to Wilmington, Massachusetts, which is a very tiny little town. And 
It, Wilmington happens to be 15 miles away, which is a 30-mile round trip. Well, why would they move to Wilmington or move out of town? Wherever they moved, they moved out of town. Well, it happens that while Peters was winning his case, which was for not a lot of money, he was losing a huge case against, a, uh, he was being sued by Susanna Sheaf, who was a wholesaler in goods, and I suspect she was the one who was, uh, who had sold the goods to him and his business partner. But he loses the case to her, and her award is more than his tax assessment, more than he want, combined with what he won in his case. So it basically wipes him out. And in 18th century uh, America and England, debtors who lost, or well, who were convicted of debt had only a few choices. You could hide in your house, you could go to debtor's prison or debtor's jail. Boston didn't have a separate debtor's prison at the time. Or, and, and hope that your creditor would give up eventually because they couldn't squeeze it out of you. You're not producing, making any money. Or you flee. And I suspect what happened is that they fled, and they tried to go underground, which would account for why there are also no records in Wilmington. Why Wilmington? Well, Wilmington was one of the earliest towns to declare seg uh, slavery illegal in Massachusetts, which meant it was friendly to blacks. When they reappear in the records, it's in 1784. Well, in 1784, Peters comes back to Boston he applies for a liquor license. He also brings back the suit against Scott. And he's immediately, almost immediately, he applies for this liquor license in August. In September, the tax record says he's in prison for debt. And I think what happens is he popped his head up after the American Revolution. Sus Susanna Sheaf said, he's back in town, I'm going after him. We all know what creditors can be like. And so he's back in jail. And this is September 1784. Phyllis dies in December. Now, the jail records are also kept quarterly, but they're like attendance records. Uh, they record who was in jail at the on the day that the record is made. They don't normally record how long they have been in jail. Sometimes they do when there are costs involved. But he was definitely in jail in September. He was definitely in jail in early 85. Was he in and out between then? Uh, the odds, I think, are very great that he was in jail when she died. And to accuse him of running off, I think, is a bit unfair. <laughs> so I, I think the jail records make a pretty strong case for what happened to him. So she dies, <clears throat> and what happens to John Peters? Well, in February of 1785, and two months after she dies, he advertises in the newspaper for the return of the manuscript of her second volume of uh, poems and letters uh, that had been borrowed by someone. He obviously never got it because he would have published it <coughs> if he had. But as I say, he's, he's in and out of jail. If you look at the records for the 1780s, he's at one point from 24 October 1788 to 24 January 1789, he's in jail straight through. He, he gets out, and he goes back in. You know, he's trying to make it. But Boston in this period is a desperate economic time. A lot of people are going, you know, they're crashing economically and going in and out of debtor's jail. So it's not that he's extraordinary in that way at all. By... The 1790s, he starts to stabilize. 
And we have him still suing people. He's suing uh, one woman named Dilly Atkins for a few shillings. He's, he's, he is a somewhat litigious, enough that in August of 1793, he was indicted as a common baritor, which is just a fancy word for uh, being very litigious. <laughs> <laughs> and the charges were dropped in February 1794, and miraculously, there are no records of him suing anybody after that. <laughs> but he is economically on the way up. He owns a house in the records of 1798. Uh, he is um, listed as, he gets back up to $200 in real estate. And these records also list occupations. Physician, lawyer, gentleman, pintle maker. <laughs> now you all know what a pintle maker is, so I won't have to tell you that. Well, a pintle is the pin on which something swings, like a rudder or a door hinge. Now, this may seem pretty bizarre combination, but again, in the 18th century, it's very common for people to have many occupations at once, simultaneously. You, you try to cover all your bases. He was accused of uh, being a... Uh, Petty Fogger, a uh, illegitimate lawyer, someone who didn't have the credentials, also being, you know, posing as a physician. Well, again, we need to put these things in context because in the 18th century, there were only three uh, law schools. There was one in Boston, one in New York, and one in Philadelphia, and black men weren't enrolled in them. And there were no med schools. People bought how, how to medicate books, or clergymen uh, act as physicians. The people in the 19th century who are objecting to his practicing law and medicine are writing in a period when those professions have become professionalized. They're not professionalized in the 18th century, so he's, he's not extraordinary in that way. Well... In the few remaining moments, let me kill him off. He, <clears throat> Odell says he went south. You know, that clearly would do me no good. So I kept digging away in the records. The 1799 uh, taking book record says that he went to Cambridge. And then the 1800 record says he's dead. A, <clears throat> that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because 1799 he was gone so I kept going yeah, there was a little temptation to say okay I can sell this up he's dead well <clears throat> what happens is he moves north as it turns out and a little bit north and he went to Charlestown, which, you know, is a, just a, a suburb now of, of Boston. And how do I know this? Well, I found a death record in, in the newspaper of a John Peters, age 55, which meant he was born around 1746, the right age. doesn't say he's a black man in this. And I thought, well, let's see if I can track him down found a record of uh, a black uh, of a man named John Peters who died in test tape, which meant that there was a um, legal proceeding to sell his goods. And that, that uh, legal proceeding is entitled John Peters, late of Charlestown, Negro and physician deceased in test tape. So we know everything he owned at the time of his death, which included a sorrel horse, um, a sled, um, two mahogany tables, 
he also left 13 books and one Bible. I mean, it's a nice list of things, including forks and plain plates and things. And I guess I should end there because he is now dead. <laughs> Thank you.